This is the first of three events in the this, this spring that the Institute is, has <coughs> put together, really to uh, focus on the importance of balancing healthy self-interest and the common good. Um, I'll leave it to Richard to reveal how that works here, but we also are offering a forum in association with the Barrett Value Center and the Vancouver Board of Trade on February 7th in Vancouver, um, entitled Leadership for a New Economy and Uncertain Times. The, other, the third event we hope to offer is a, the launch of a really fabulous documentary just recently produced by a new foundation called the World Servers Foundation. Uh, and we'll have to give you the dates and times of that as we go, so keep um, tapping into our website. Richard is a friend and colleague, and I think it was almost three years ago that we managed to attract Richard to come here at the Royal Roads in February, so just uh, it'll be a couple of weeks, it'll be three years ago. <coughs> and in that time, he has become a mentor, a friend, a colleague, and a partner, really. Um, um, we've met in all kinds of places, like here, and then the next part, part, part point was Stockholm, and the next point was Asheville, North Carolina. The next point was just recently, last November, in Sopran, Hungary, and now he's back. And I'm so pleased that he's also a co-teacher of this, this new certificate that we are launch, have launched called uh, a, a certificate, a graduate certificate in values-based leadership. I'm going to, um, uh, our president, Alan Cahoon, will introduce him, but I want just first to say that um, at the end of our session, there is a book signing and uh, over here, and um, I'll leave it to Richard to uh, bring forth the connection between balancing self-interest and the common good here. <laughs> Alan Cahoon is our president, I think, for four years, the last four years, um, and he knows the importance of values, both to what they mean in organizations <coughs> and also what they mean in a broader social context. So I'll invite you, Alan, please, to come forward to introduce Richard. Thanks, Marilyn, and appreciate the opportunity to introduce uh, Richard to you. Uh, as Marilyn said, uh, it was about three years ago that we first met. Uh, he came and did a presentation on uh, the culture of values assessment. And for us, it made a lot of sense. It, uh, it was a framework around values that uh, with, with the ag agenda that really should, be, uh, should prompt discussion and dialogue as opposed to becoming an end in itself. And it incorporated strong uh, theoretical base uh, f to it, so it, it was grounded well. But unlike other instruments that, that, I, that I certainly was aware of, it, uh, the instrument wasn't the, the, the purpose. The purpose was the questions and the values that came out of that. So subsequently, we used that at railroads as a basis for a cultural values assessment, as a prompt to have conversations around engagement, around uh, what I um, call a regenerative work culture. So he had that impact, and I think, uh, as Marilyn has described, the relationship that's, that's cultivated over that. The Institute for Value-Based Leadership is one of the uh, centers of the university that really reflects the kind of research that we're interested about, which is uh, research and uh, research applied to practice that's uh, relevant, that's really trying to make the world a better place in a sense, certainly organizations a better place. And I think that we wanted to recognize uh, Richard and the contribution that he made and uh, appointed him as an adjunct uh, faculty member for at Royal Roads. And as Marilyn said, is now involved in, in the program that we're doing our, our uh, c a certificate in value-based uh, leadership with some of you are uh, associated with it. So I just wanted to say that, I w that I'm delighted to introduce uh, Richard. Uh, he's the founder and chair chairperson of the Barrett Value Center. And uh, he, uh, he's helped connect, uh, as Marilyn has said, what we're trying to do in terms of our center with uh, 
an international organization and a group of, uh, of uh, like-minded colleagues, if you like, that are trying to do similar kinds of things. It's really what education should be. It's about doing research that makes that, that kind of application. And, uh, and we're delighted that he, that he does this. He's, he's recognized internationally for the uh, intellectual leadership that he provides to, uh, uh, to, the, to the topic. Um, he recently completed a, his manuscript called Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations, scheduled for publication in 2012, I think, Richard. Um, we're pleased to have him speak tonight on his new book, The New uh, Paradigm Leadership. And uh, we're able to uh, live stream this to, uh, to places beyond. So, Richard, uh, we're delighted to have you. Thank you for coming and uh, look forward to your presentation. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. Anybody out there? Yes. <laughs> Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Three questions we should all be asking ourselves every day. Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Well, tonight my purpose is to share with you uh, my journey over the past four or five years of uh, a lot of research into leadership and, and more recently into how the hell are we going to get out of this mess we're in at a global level. And uh, I must say, it's been a fantastic and interesting journey to think about that solidly for the last uh, couple of years. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about many of the things that um, I've been doing and thinking about and sharing that with you. And uh, hopefully it might resonate with you and uh, hopefully there may be some new ideas there that you can pick up and run with. So let me uh, get underway right away and say, right now, at the beginning, I, what I want to talk about is, you know, where are we in the world with this topic called leadership? And um, where are we? Well, we're in crisis. We're in crisis because we're leaving behind a whole belief structure about leadership, which isn't working. It's not working anywhere in the world. And we need to, new, to a new leadership paradigm, and I'm going to describe what that might be. But first of all, it's just not me who's talking about this. Here's three people from Harvard Business School saying things like, after conducting 14 formal studies and more than 1,000 interviews, directly observing dozens of executives in action and compiling innumerable service, I'm completely convinced that most organizations today lack the leadership they need. And this is John Cotter, a well-known person at Harvard Business School. And then Shoshana Zuboff uh, says something similar, but I'll just go to what I put in bold. She said, We've managed to produce a generation of managers and business professionals that is deeply mistrusted and despised by a majority of people in our society and around the world. This is a terrible failure. <laughs> These are people at Harvard Business School. Okay, one more, Bill George, who I really admire. He says, the problem is we have a wrong-headed notion of what constitutes a leader, driven by obsession with leaders at the top. He says, every successful business leader has to make the shift from I to we. From I to we. So, what is this mess that we've got into with this old paradigm leadership? Well, we've got lots of issues going on. I mean, right now the global economy is number one, and quite frankly, um, if you were to ask me to make a prediction, and I know you're not going to ask me, but I'm going to tell you, I think we're in for a big collapse pretty soon. And, and I'm, I'm actually really delighted about that because we will, from those ashes will come something which benefits everybody in a more equal way than it does at the moment. Right now, it's all about the elites, the powerful elites, the business elites, and, uh, and all about making money, and it's all about development as economic growth, which is basic, the basic idea of the World Bank. Now, I worked at the World Bank 18 years, so I know all about the World Bank, but we've got lots of issues, and also in Europe. Global terrorism, I don't need to say too much about all of these. Pollution, energy resilience, pandemics, species accession, food resilience, waste, poverty, water shortages, climate change, and natural disasters. And you know what? 
We can't solve those problems at the same level of thinking that we created them. You see, you know, you look around and see what's happening in the world right now and the G20 and everything. The tinkering, the trying to fix something that is fundamentally broken. Yes, oh, I've got somebody here who really talks my language. Okay, she's been saying that for years. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to work together before the end of the evening. Well, watch out. So, so, what's this all about? Well, basically, the problems of existence have become global but the decision-making structures we have for dealing with them are national. We cannot move forward without a high degree of global cooperation. And what's getting in the way? Self-interest of our leaders. And, in a certain extent, we are our own problem too, because you know, in the rich nations, we're, you know, we're not feeling the pain, so we really don't want to do anything. And so what's got to happen is, we've all got to feel the pain. And then something will happen. I love this quote from uh, Tex Gunnings. He says, um, he's a, from Unilever, he, he is no longer, but he, at that time he was. He said, the paradigm that divides the world into the social sector, the private sector, and the government sector is not working. It creates artificial barriers where each are constituted of the problem. So we have to combine our forces, our efforts, and our competences. So, I would say this is, business is really a wholly owned subsidiary of society, and society is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. If we lose our environment and our life support systems, our society will perish. And if we lose our society, we will lose our economy and our business will perish too. See, not many leader, business leaders have got that understanding that they're part of a much bigger system and they're stuck in their own little world. But you see, they live a very uh, schizophrenic life because, you know, uh, during the day, they're trying to run their businesses, not caring about these uh, economic externalities of the environment, etc. And they come home in the evening and they're bouncing their grandchildren on their knees, saying, thinking, well, I really need to have a sustainable future for my grandchildren. That's a terrible place to live in. And so, there's this beginning to grow a recognition that business is a part of society. And I love this, this new movement. I'm interested to see where it's going, conscious capitalism, which, which takes some of these ideas and says, yes, you know, business is part of society. And if we, yes, we can run business profitably, but let's do it in a way where we care about everybody. I really recommend the book, um, Firms of Endearment, Firms of Endearment really gets into this in a deep way. So we need a new leadership paradigm, a shift from a focus in I to we, a shift from self-interest to the common good, and from being the best in the world to the best for the world. So many businesses, when they do their vision and mission statements, it's like to be the number one supplier of. Well, quite frankly, nobody gives a damn. As a customer, I don't care if you're the number one supplier. What I want to know is, how are you impacting my world? So, I would say, ultimately, the problems of existence we face are issues of consciousness. And we'll only get beyond this stage of our collective evolution if we can put aside our narrow self-interest and focus on the whole system and build a values-driven framework of policies that support the common good. But I have some good news. For the first time in human history, we have the possibility of making the evolution of consciousness conscious. Why? Because we can measure it. That is actually the first time in 14 billion years of evolution we've actually been able to measure consciousness. If you can measure something, you can manage it. I'm going to show you how we do that. It's uh, in these two books that I wrote uh, sorry, some time ago. 
Well, I'll just give you a quick overview of the model that I use. It's based on Maslow's hierarchy, which you're probably all familiar with. They call these lower order needs the deficiency needs. We don't get any sense of lasting satisfaction if we, uh, uh, for being able to meet these needs, but we feel a sense of anxiety if these needs are not met. So it's that physiological needs, love and safety, and self-esteem. And, uh, but once we've got these needs met, it doesn't really matter. We move on to our growth needs, what Maslow calls self-actualization. And when these needs are fulfilled, we just want to go on and get deeper and deeper into that space because it brings us happiness and joy instead of anxiety and fear. So what I did was I took uh, Maslow's concept of self-actualization and I broke it down into some component parts that I uh, arrived at by studying Vedic philosophy. The concept of soul consciousness, cosmic consciousness, God consciousness, and unity consciousness. And when I looked deeply into what that meant, I realized it was just different levels of self-actualization. So I blended Maslow from the West with Vedic philosophy from the East and built this seven levels of consciousness model. So I expanded self-actualization, I substituted states of consciousness for hierarchy of needs, and each state of consciousness is defined by specific values and behaviors. So what I'm saying is, any level of consciousness you care to name in these seven levels, you, if you tell me what your values are, I can tell you which levels of consciousness you're operating from. That's how we can measure consciousness. So, this is the personal consciousness, survival about financial security, putting food on the, safe, on the table, and creating a safe environment for you and your family. And then we move to relationship consciousness. That's about belonging, and it's about feeling loved by yourself, and loving yourself and loving others too. And at level three, we talk about the feeling of self-worth, pride in your personal performance, and feeling a positive sense of order in your life. Now, these three needs are needs that we all grow up with when we're first born and we move through those early years of our life. This represents our normal development. And uh, when we have any subconscious fears about meeting these needs, um, then we get these limiting values showing up at level one, control and greed, being liked and blame and power and status. In other words, what happens is, during those first seven years of our lives, when our limbic brain is well developed, but our prefrontal cortex, the reasoning part of our brain, is not functioning, we look at everything that happens in our world from the point of view of satisfying, bringing pleasure and avoiding pain, but it's attached to emotional thinking. There's no reasoning goes on. And so, during those first seven or eight years of our lives, if we learn that we are, do not have enough, or we're not loved enough, or we are not enough, those stay with us for the rest of our lives, and that becomes the fodder for psycho psychotherapists. And, and let me tell you, you know, everybody is brought up in a dysfunctional family. And if you have a family, it is dysfunctional, I can tell you. Babies are born trusting. It's the only way to be born into the world, and they lose that trust through the relationships that they, they build. But to what extent depends on the degree of self-actualization of their parents. If their parents are highly self-actualized, they can bring up a baby with minimal fears, subconscious fears, at these first three levels. But if you, you know, like the masses, are, people are, are brought up in difficult conditions and you know, they learn how hard it is to be in their life and that maybe they've got abusive parents and how difficult it is to, to find pleasure and avoid pain. And, you know, that stays with us then for the rest of our lives and colors everything that we do. But, you know, it's our stuff and we just have to, and we begin to realize that, huh, if I want to lead a better life, I better move to level four. I better understand why I'm creating this upset. Because... The, the truth is, nobody upsets you. You upset yourself by your beliefs about what is happening. You trigger the old belief that you learned in childhood when you weren't having a good time. 
And so when you say, you make me angry, <laughs> wait a minute. No, you triggered my belief, fear-based belief, and that made me angry. It's all about you. If you're upset, it's all about you. It's not about the other person. They're just helping you grow. Sometimes that's hard to remember in the heat of the moment. So you have to insert a pause before you actually do something. Because otherwise you're just going to react from that subconscious belief. Well, if you can insert a pause, you can move to conscious belief-based decision-making and you can actually reflect before something happens. Any of you ever received an email and you go, Wah! Oh my God, I sent it to everybody. <laughs> and then you regret it. That's a react reaction from a subconscious fear-based belief that you're hanging on to. We're going to talk about how, let it, about how to let that go later. So we move to level four, personal growth. Understanding our deepest motivations and experiencing responsible freedom. This is called the level of individuation, where you begin to let go of the beliefs that you learnt during childhood and the beliefs of your culture, which no longer serve you. And this is where true freedom is, in becoming your own person. And then we move fully into level five, where you begin to encounter your soul. The ego fully meets the soul. The soul appears at level four, because in that individuation, letting go of the fears of the ego, you give space, an opening for your soul to come through. And at level five, this is where you develop that sense of internal cohesion when the beliefs of the ego align with the values of the soul. And you feel on purpose, you have meaning in your life, you've got passion, you've got commitment, and you're out there doing something important. And then you realize, well, if I really want to follow my passion, I need to work with others. And that's level six consciousness. We move into strategic alliances with other people and collaborate with other people. And at the same time, because you're working on your growth needs, you deepen your own sense of internal connectedness. And once you're into this making a difference, you're having so much fun, you just move then into the level of service, level seven, to humanity and the planet, or to, or to your children, or to your spouse, or to somebody. But you begin to live a life of service. And this is a, the highest level. You feel totally aligned with who you are. Now, is higher better? No. It's a development evolutionary path, but you need to be able to focus positively, positively at every level. You want to be able to make money and survive. You want to have good relationships. You want to feel a sense of pride in what you do. You want to be operating at all of these levels of consciousness. Full spectrum is the way to go. So what about organizations? It's the same thing. Survival is about making money in a for-profit. If it's in a government, it's about having enough money, resources to do what you want to do. It's about belonging and loyalty and employee satisfaction and customer satisfaction. It's about high performance systems and processes at level three. Now, there are the downside of this, if you get too focused, too much fear at level one, you get into greed. Enron, beautiful example. You know, the underlying belief is I don't have enough. That's level one. The underlying belief at level two is I'm not loved enough or respected enough. At level three, I am not enough. So, so I have to fight for the corner office and I want the parking spot nearest the front door because that is who I am. You'll know who I am. Status. So there's a positive side and there's a limiting side. And then we move to level four, which is the continuous renewal and learning of the organization is about diversity, accountability, adaptability, empowerment, teamwork, working together. And then we really come to work together at level five where we have a shared vision and a shared values. We're all heading in the same direction. And this is when people align their passion with the vision of the organization and they come to work every day totally inspired. Can't wait to get to work in the morning. Are you like that? Good. Then we get to 
Now, the organization is firing on all cylinders, but it begins to realize to build resilience and be out in the world, it needs to form strategic alliances. And then as we form those strategic alliances, we also want to deepen the sense of internal connectedness by focusing on employee fulfillment. And then finally, we begin to realize that the organization is part of society and that we better be ethical and that we better be socially responsible. We better think about future generations. So as I said earlier, you can see there are words that go with each of these levels. So if we could ask people, you know, which values in the, out of this list represent who you are and how your organization operates and how you'd like it to operate, we can begin to map consciousness, which I, this is what we do. So here's the first. So only, we only ask three questions. Pick 10 values from this list of about 80 or 90 that represent who you are. So this person picked accountability. That's level four. Balance homework. That's level four. Enthusiasm, it's level five. But they don't know that. They're just words. The words that people resonate with when I say, pick 10 values that represent who you are. Ah, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. Then we ask, pick 10 values that represent how your organization operates. Slightly different list, because we've got customers in there here now and organizational stuff. And then 10 values that represent how you'd like your organization to operate. So we've got personal values, current culture, and desired culture. And we can begin to map that. But so. What we've, if we had 100 employees and they all had 10 votes, which they do, then we can say how many, which values got the most votes. So here's the top 10 values in this organization. Now you see here, there are some white dots which represent these words, image, L, tradition, L, control, L. What does that stand for? L. It's a potentially limiting value. If you've got control, it's potentially, if your image is a potentially limiting value. Blame is a potentially, potentially limiting value. It's a value because it's showing up. In other words, it, if it wasn't showing up, it wouldn't be valuable. But it's a potentially limiting value. So here's the top 10 values, of, just an example. Now, it's 100 people and they all had 10 votes for the current culture. So that's a thousand votes. So we can actually distribute all of the votes at all of the levels to see what is the distribution of consciousness. And all of those potentially limiting values show up at the first three levels. And we can actually count up, find out how, what proportion of those potentially limiting values are there. And this gives us something called cultural entropy. It's the degree of dysfunction in the system from fear-based anxieties and beliefs. Cultural entropy. It's a really important number because from this number, I can tell you so much about what's going on. Now imagine if we could do this in our countries, in our societies. Oh, well, we can, I'm going to show you. So, here's a typical engineering company. 339 people took part in this uh, uh, survey. Here are their personal, the top 10 personal values. These are the values that are most important to the employees in their personal lives. Honesty got 169 votes. It's at level five. It's an individual value. Accountability came number two. Here's the current culture. Continuous improvement was the top scoring value with 111 out of 339 people. Customer satisfaction got 111 too, and so on. And then we've got the desired culture here. Accountability was the top scoring value. Actually, accountability goes all the way through this system. And so we've got one matching personal value with the current culture is accountability. And we've got four matching current cultures, that's these orange values, with the desired culture. And we've got these three limiting values showing up here, which is job insecurity, inconsistent, and blame. So what we get from this is a conversation starter. It's almost like this is a mirror into the organization. And now we can see why we can see this is who people are, this is what they've got, and this is what they want. And that is the beginning of the transformation effort. We've also got the distribution of all of the personal values, the distribution of all the current culture values, and the distribution of the desired cultural values. And the total percentage of limiting values in the survey was 23%. So I know though, I know 23% is not too bad, but when you get up to 30, 40%, you're getting into really serious conditions. And when you get above 45%, there's a good chance an organization will go bankrupt because there's so much energy going into those limiting values instead of into the positive work of the organization. Here's an example. Uh, 
Tom Boardman here took over this, one of the four big banks in South Africa in 2003, and it was almost bankrupt. And in fact, when Tom took over, he loves to tell the story that the next day the share price dropped another 6%. I mean, it was a dire situation. Tom called in McKinsey, and they started doing some work around structures, etc. And then he said, well, what do we do about the culture? And McKinsey said, well, contact Barrett Value Center. And he started measuring the values, 2005, 2006. Here are the current culture values in these years. And here's the level of cultural entropy, 25%. And these are the values that were showing up. Two limiting values, bureaucracy and silo mentality. I mean, 25% is not that bad, but it's still not good. 2006, he worked on the results. Entropy went down to 19%. Continued to work the following year, it went down to 17%. The following year, it went down to 14%, then to 13 and then to 13 And now, last year, it went down to 11%. And as, as, as they've worked with their values, they've managed their values, they've managed their consciousness, this is what I meant. We can measure consciousness, we can map it, we can manage it. So in 2010, this was what they looked like. No limiting values showing up right here, but still a lot of values at this level three consciousness, which is about productivity, efficiency, etc. I want you to notice that community, involve, community involvement there, which a lot of banks have and like to have, was number eight in the top ten. And commitment was number ten. And client-driven was number five in the desired culture. It was actually, it was in the current culture, but it was also in the desired culture. The following year, community involvement dropped out of the top ten and in popped environmental awareness. Wow, that was interesting. What happened there? And commitment went up from number 10 to number 8, and client-driven moved up too. So what I'm seeing here is, you, in fine detail, you can manage a culture. You can see what's going on. You can pull the right levers in order to keep improving that culture. And why would you want to? So here's the entropy. Why would you want to do that? There's the entropy going down year by year. This is the people who responded to the survey going up every year, because they don't have to do the survey. But people begin to realize that if they do the survey, the leaders are listening, we're going to get some changes. So in my opinion, counts. Staff engagement went up. We had a bit of a drop in 2010, and it's climbing up again. Closing share price went, went up and up and up. But then we had 2008 and the economic meltdown, but it's been building up again. You, you can. What changed in the dynamics of the leadership? Many things. They took, what they did was they listened to the results. Now, one of the things that uh, I've got some videos, and I'm not showing them tonight, of Tom talking about this, but I'll give you one example he talks about. He says, you know, the desired culture, there was a really strong need for accountability that came up. Everybody's asking for account. So they did a focus group on accountability, and it turned out that the grading system, sorry, it was on hierarchy, sorry, it was hierarchy. Hi, there's a limiting value. And so they did a focus group on hierarchy and said, well, why is it affecting us so much? Well, it turned out hierarchy was linked to the grade system. So what he did was he abolished the grade system because they had like 27 grades and it was regraded every six months. And one month before the grading, everybody was on the best behavior in order to get a higher grade. So they would get more money etc cetera, etc cetera, more benefits he abolished the grading system people didn't like it and they said well how are we going to know how well we're doing and he said he said well you'll know it in your paycheck <laughs> and they and the next year hierarchy disappeared out of the top 10 values just disappeared and so you, what you do is you pay attention to what's showing up and then what tom would he would pick three things every year and work on them and so he drove down the entropy and built up the number of matching values. I didn't show you that, but every year the number of matching values between current and desired culture increased from three to four to five to six. So people were feeling more aligned and less entropy. So they were feeling, so staff engagement went up. So we did a, we did a study of, with the 169 companies in, in Australia where we mapped staff engagement level with cultural entropy. It was a straight line relationship. When staff engagement is high, cultural entropy, dysfunction is very low, and vice versa. High staff engagement, low entropy, three times the revenue growth than the other way around. If you've got high entropy, low engagement, you're, you know, you get, you're making $100, 
revenue, and if you do it the other way around, you're making 300. It's a significant difference because people bring their discretionary energy to work when they're working in a culture that, that they're aligned with. You know, why does Fortune 500 uh, company uh, map the 100 best companies to work for every year? <laughs> because these are the high performers. And why are they high performers? It's right there, the best companies to work for. In other words, employees feel engaged. And what you unlock is the discretionary energy that people bring to the workplace, which they will not give you if they don't feel engaged. They save that discretionary energy for their pastimes and their family. But when they feel really engaged, man, company can take off. So what can evolution teach us about this new leadership paradigm? So this is, uh, so what we've been talking about up to now is really about you know, my first uh, two or three books around map it, mapping and measuring consciousness. Now we're moving into the new leadership paradigm. And I want to talk about the three universal principles of evolution. Now, it took me like five years to figure out these principles. And you, when you'll see what the principles are, you'll go, oh my god, why did it take you five years? Because I had to study physics and chemistry and biology and sociology and find out what was common. What were the patterns of 14 billion years of evolution? And there are three universal principles. And they apply to everything. They apply to atoms, cells, dogs, cats, nations, and human beings. Let's talk about evolution. The continual unfolding ability to respond to increasingly complex life conditions. As the com life conditions get more complex, you have to shift and move. You, you have to develop a more complex mind. You have to be able to respond and react appropriately to that larger context. So you get an increase in external complexity, demands an increase in internal complexity. So the first stage, from the Big Bang to the present day, the, at each level, energy, atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, and creatures. Stage one, entities have to learn how to become viable and independent in their framework of existence. If you're not viable and independent, you perish, like human beings do. The next stage is when framework conditions become more complicated and difficult in order to survive, you bond together with other viable independent entities to create a group structure, which is more resilient. And then as framework conditions become even worse, what happens is those viable independent group structures now cooperate with each other to create a higher order entity. And so this is how, from the Big Bang, we had particles and waves of information existing in a quantum energy field. Out of that, as the conditions changed, came the carbon atom. The carbon atom became viable independent. It bonded to form group structures called molecules, and those molecules cooperated with each other to form cells. One of those cells, the eukaryotic cell, became viable independent, bonded with other cells to create organisms, and those organisms cooperated to create creatures. One of those creatures, Homo sapiens, is trying to become viable independent, bonding together to form nations. They tried it with tribes, bands and tribes and city-states, and now we're nations. And those nations are now trying to cooperate with each other to create a higher order entity called humanity. That's what's happening, and you see it. Once you understand these three universal stages of evolution, you see it everywhere. The European Union, for example, is independent group structures, nations, Corporate bonding together, cooperating to form a higher order entity, the European Union. I might be able to. I'm going to, I'm going to make it really obvious for you because I'm going to get one of you to come up here and help me make it obvious. Stage one, entities learn how to become viable independent. Two, as life conditions become more complex, they bond together to form group structures and those group structures then cooperate to create a higher order entity. So. I need a body with a mind attached to it to come up here on the stage with me. And you know who I'm going to pick, don't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. What's your name? I'm a backstage person. Wynne Williams. 
Will you agree? Just come on up and stand with me. Okay. How are you? I'm quite inspired by your view of things, but I don't agree with the last thing. I think it's a corporate imposition <laughs> on the European nations, which is not the development, but the We'll, we'll get onto that in a minute. Okay. Just be <laughs> <mistaken>. <laughs> These Bible independent thinkers, you know. <laughs> What's your name? Wiluya. Think, Will, Wiluya. think Hawaii or right. Hallelujah. Okay, that's Wiluya. enough chat. Okay, okay listen. <laughs> <laughs> Wiluya. Okay. There's trillions of something in your body. What are they? Vibrational energy. Well, no, we're next step up. Come on, step up one. <laughs> oh, you want me to go? You know, you do. Trillions of things. Cells, 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 cells. cells, cells, yeah. cells, cells I cells, thought yeah. that was the obvious. Okay. Yeah, well, it was the obvious answer. I'm making it easy for you because okay. I don't know your level of education. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, my great aunt was a professor at Oxford. Too much information. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, though. Wiluluya. Yes. Wiluluya. <laughs> Wiluluya. It's like Alleluia, but yeah, with a yeah, W. That's right. Wiluluya. Exactly. If you graze your hand or cut it, what happens? Well, you know, it might bleed, but yeah. I can't be sure right now. Yeah, but what would happen mm -hmm. now? Just normal situation. Hey, Pretend bleeding. you're normal, for okay, God's sake. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> well, that's an effort. It would bleed. It would bleed, and then what would happen? Well, I would go to the hospital. Yeah, and then what would happen? I don't know, I might die. <laughs> oh God, she's a pessimist too. <laughs> okay, all right, it's, a, it's just a little graze, okay? It's just a little graze. It would heal. Oh my God, it would heal. Too much information. It would heal. Healed already, look, gone. He's a, he's a faith healer, too. Yeah. So, so, did you tell your hand to heal when that happened? No, no, that happens automatically. Yeah, the cells know yes. what to do. They're yes, Bible they independent do. entities. They yes. know exactly what to do. Cells know what yes, to do. Yes. The Bible independent <coughs> entities. Oh, yes, they do. You, you don't need to go to the cleaners. Yes. That's part of the thing. I was eating at the funeral today. No, too much information. All right. Now, there are 11 or 12 of these in your body. What are they? 11 or 12? Yeah, roughly. Um, 11 or 12? Yeah. Or I don't know exactly. Yeah! Brilliant! Hallelujah, oh, Wilulia. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I never counted them. No, did I? I'm not a biologist. Nor am I. I wish somebody could give me the right answer, but I, for the moment I talk about 11 oh, or 12. Okay. Organs, okay. what are they? They're composed of cells. They're viable independent entities, cells, which are bonded together to form group right. structures. Yes, yes. Definitely, okay. Yes. Now, what would happen if your organs started competing for oxygen or blood? Competing? Yeah. <laughs> Think really hard. I mean, what would happen if your organs started competing for oxygen or blood? Well, I already said it. I'd be dead. Well, okay. But well, before you get to be dead. What's, what's the process between being good and being dead? Somewhere in the middle. <laughs> Sick. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Sick. <laughs> I'm not a good subject. You should choose. It's all right. No, okay. Well, 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 I'm, I'm soldiering on here. Okay. So, 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 stop. Don't ask me any more questions. Okay. So these organs, if they started competing, you'd get sick. Oh, yes. Okay. But they don't because they share the... They're all working for the common good. Yes, I hope so. Okay. Do you tell your heart to beat? No, not No. Do you tell your lungs to breathe? No, not normally. Okay. So, so these are viable independent entities, cells, bonded together from group structures, organs, viable independent... They know what to do. And you are sitting on top of that and that's all happening. Yeah, that's right. And it takes care of you. Oh, yes. Autonomous. Yeah. Fantastic. Now, let's imagine that your cells are employees. Oh, God. <laughs> no, no, we're not going there. I'm just imagining it. <laughs> I know they're all demanding a raise, but look, we're not going there. <laughs> okay. Your cells 
our employees, and they bond together to form group structures, which are business units, and those business units cooperate to create a high order entity, the organization. And if they have a shared vision and if they have shared values, everything's good. But when they start competing, they get sick. See, I'm talking about your body, I'm talking about the organization, I'm talking about a nation too. I've noticed. Noticed. Is there anything you want to say before I ask you to leave? <laughs> yeah, where, where do you teach this class? Well, just around the corridor on one floor down. <laughs> uh, I might sign up if you can stand it. <laughs> Thank you. Last year, so. Yeah, and how are you feeling right now? Delighted. Brilliant. Being in front of the public. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Whoa. Okay. Cells are viable independent entities. They know what to do. They maintain internal stability and external equilibrium. Cells bond together to form group structures. Organs, organs cooperate, create a high order. Entity. You got the pattern. This happens in nations too. You know, citizens. They become viable independent entities. They bond together to form a nation. Nations cooperate to create a higher order entity. Only the ex first experiment we did with that with the United Nations failed because too much power at the top. So, new leadership paradigm landing system. All right. Um, I didn't want to write this book. No, no, I, I, I didn't. I, you know, I... My soul talks to me, said, write a book on leadership. I thought, oh my God, why would I want to do that? So I went to Amazon.com and I typed in leadership and there were 300,000 titles. I said, okay, so you understand why I don't want to do this? And soul said, okay, and wait a minute, stop, stop. You need to think more closely and said, look, get Donald Trump's book, get Jack Welch's book, get this guy's book, and then analyze what levels of consciousness they're operating from, because you can do that, you've got a model. And I began to realize that everybody writes about leadership from the levels of consciousness at which they operate. And so I've got a model here, seven levels of consciousness, full spectrum. Why wouldn't I write a book about that? That was the key. So 530 pages later, this book came out. But it's more than a book. It's also a manual for personal coaching. And basically, I think, the reason why I had to do this because what I realized is when evolution produced Homo sapiens, the arrow of evolution shifted from physical evolution to consciousness evolution. And so we need to look now as development as the evolution of human consciousness, not as development as economic growth. Because right in front of your, our eyes, evolution is happening. You know what's going on in the European Union right now? They're having these, all these difficulties with finances and they could either break up or come together. And I knew they would come back together. Except for the Brits, of course. They always want to be on their own, do their own thing. Still power hungry, I'm afraid. Yeah, anyhow, um, sorry anybody from Britain watching, but it's true. Uh, me too, I live there, so it's, uh, it's okay. So anyhow, but what we see there is evolution happening because that is the frontier of evolution, what's going on in Europe right now. These are nations bonding together to form a group structure. This is actually evolution happening before our eyes. Most people think evolution is something physical in the past. No, it's about consciousness. It's been going on for 14 billion years and right now it's happening before our very eyes. How privileged we are to watch evolution. How privileged we are to participate in that. And how privileged we are to attempt to make it conscious instead of unconscious. So, the first stage of becoming viable and independent is really about levels one, two, and three. Now, when I came up with the three universal stages of evolution, and I came up with the seven levels many years before, I was amazed when I saw they actually mapped. So, Stage two, internal cohesion, is about moving from level four and five to five. And stage three is about level six and seven, cooperating to form a higher order entity. So, what I realized is, if you can't lead the, yourself, then it's impossible to lead others. And if you, can, if 
if you can lead yourself, then you should be able to lead a team. And if you can't lead others, then you shouldn't be, you sh shouldn't be leading an organization. If you can't lead an organization, then you should not be leading in your community or in your nation. Because the leaders of our nations actually manage huge organizations. The national health, the corrections, everything. And most of them have no experience of managing huge organizations. They can't even manage themselves. Have you watched TV from the parliament or whatever you have over here in Canada? I know it's like that in the UK. You know, they, they, they actually make it live broadcast. And you listen to the level of debate and you wonder where these school children, when they were let out of school. But that's the level of debate that goes on. They're spending so much time trying to look good and put the other people down. And we elected these people? Is this the best we've got to offer? I don't want to live in a democracy like that with these kids ruling. These big egos making all the decisions. I don't want that anymore. And I don't think the rest of us want it either. But that's, what, that's the old leadership paradigm. And it's going to fail. So, first of all, it starts with leading self, personal mastery, internal cohesion, external cohesion, leading a team, leading an organization. And what I've done is, in the book, is I've, New Legit Paradigm, I've, I've written about 100 pages on each of these and all of these stages. And it's a learning system because there's the book. There's a website. And it's a really wiki website because what do I mean by that? The whole book is on that website and, and attached are these learning modules and journals. And you can download these journals for $30 each. In each, in each of these modules, there's 30 or 40 exercises for leading yourself, leading a team, leading an organization, and leading a society. I wanted to make a world-class leadership development system available for everybody on the planet for less than $100. And, as I say on the videos that go are on the website, if you can't afford that, we'll send it to you free. Because... Right now, leadership development is the privilege of the elites. You've got to spend a lot of money to get on a leadership development or be at the top of your organization. I want to make leadership development available to everybody, whether they can afford it or not. Well, I don't need to talk about what's in the book, but it's leading self, leading others, leading an organization, leading a society. Here's the website. It's a wiki system. In other words, what I'm saying here is that as people use the system and give us feedback about the, the, the exercises, uh, we, we will change the exercises, we'll add exercises, we'll take exercises away, we'll make it interactive. So these are the journals and workbooks that you can download with all the exercises in them. So the book is about 30 or 35 dollars and each one of these is 30 each and, and that's basically covering our costs. So, the workbook's like this, leading self, then you learn to lead others, and then you learn to lead an organization. And there are feedback loops, because when you begin to learn to lead others, you begin to realize more stuff about yourself, and then you, so you have to re-change, change who you are, and then start leading others in a different way again, and the same. Go down. So who's using this? Well, consultants and coaches, change agents, and OD practitioners, who are looking for a new cost-effective way to make leadership training available to large numbers of people. So, you know, right now, a large organization of, say, four or 5,000 people spends all of their training budget on the top, 20, top 50 people. Well, they get much more bang for the book if they spent that money and put everybody through leading self. And then you'd get self-actualized individuals showing up. And then save some money for the upper echelons, but make leadership development available to everybody. Universities and business schools, and that's what's happening in our, in our course right now. With some of the exercises in leading self, we're actually using them uh, as part of the values-based leadership course. And anybody who wants to just to grow and develop all on their own, they can get this system and work with it. So now I just want to move in and pull this all to a closure by talking about the book I've been working on for the last six months and which I'll finish in the next two weeks. It's called Love, Fear and the Destiny of Nations, Volume 1, The Impact of the Evolution of Consciousness on World Affairs, Volume 2, Building Successful Communities and Nations. We've got a lot of data because we've mapped the values now of 15 nations. We've got four more lined up. By the time I write this book, 
volume two, we'll have close to 20 nations that we can write about where we've mapped the consciousness of those nations and we can see what's happening. So, a little bit about this. These are the nations where we've actually mapped the values of the nations. How do we do it? Very simply, we have a survey like we showed in the organization. You pick 10 values about who you are, 10 values you see in your nation, 10 values you'd like to see in your nation. As easy as that. Here's the seven levels of national consciousness. Similar to before, level one, economic stability, level two, social stability, level three, institutional effectiveness, democratic processes, strong cohesive national identity, strategic alliances with other nations, and global sustainability. So level one, two, three, becoming viable and dependent, four and five, bonding to form a group structure, level six and seven, reaching out to other nations. This We just did it. Did Nobody, we did not ask permission. No, but did you, did you have a group of people, or did you do it just on your own? Let me tell you. So, uh, let me just pull this one back. Um, I had this idea in 2002, because we've been successfully working with organizations. Now over 3,000 organizations have done this assessment all over the world. So in 2002, I put up on a website, our website, um, a national values assessment. Anybody in the world could go to it, pick three value, 10 values about who they are, 10 values they saw in their nation, 10 values they like to see, and they could pick their nation. And say, am I male or female? And I just left it up for four years. And I started downloading the results. And I'm like, oh my God, look at Sweden, look at USA. I began to realize we really, it worked in nations just as well as it worked in organizations. You could see the differences. Yeah, people are coming to our website, yeah, our business website. So then we said, okay, let's start doing this. So seriously, in 2007, Denmark came forward, some consultants we worked with there who use our tools came forward and said, we'd like to map the values in Denmark. Because we'd already done it in Argentina and Latvia and one or two other places. And they said, well, we'd like to do it. And I said, okay. And so they did it. And then uh, Iceland came forth and then Sweden and then a whole host of other. So sometimes these were consultants using our tools in those countries who wanted to demonstrate that it was possible to map the values of the nation. In other cases, it was the actual governments who actually got on board, like Latvia and in Iceland. And so we've now had, over the last three years, every year we've had a meeting called the National Values Coalition Meeting, where the people doing this work meet together to discuss how we're learning by doing. And we had our last meeting in Hungary just a few months ago. And it, the, the whole thing is gathering momentum fast, because we're beginning to realize that you know how you can transform the culture of an organization? You know what? You can transform the culture of a nation. We don't know quite fully how to do that. And you can definitely do it in communities. We're working in communities now to transform the values of communities. But the first thing is you have to measure them. You have to measure where people are in their personally, what they're seeing, what they'd like to see. And that's how we're progressing. So this is the level of cultural entropy in all of the nations that we've mapped so far. Notice Bhutan has the lowest level of cultural entropy and um, Iceland has the highest, along with USA. Now, in the USA, we've been mapping for the last three years. In Sweden, we've been mapping for the last three years. And we have, I put Canada here, just to show you where it came out. And um, so this is like the league table of cultural entropy, the degree of dysfunction in the nation. I want to dig into that a little more. So when you've got... L Entropy above 41%, and you can see that we have, in a number of these nations here, uh, you've got problems. This is the level of cultural entropy. It reflects endemic issues that could lead to demonstrations, violent disorder, major financial disruption, and indicating a need for change in policy or a change in government. It's important to reduce the level of cultural entropy to improve individual and societal well-being. So, guess what happened? In August, unbelievably, in August 2008, we mapped the values of Iceland. I went there on September the 6th and we pre presented the results and entropy was up at 56%. And so as I was doing public speeches and on television, I said, you know, if, if Iceland was an organization, you'd be going bankrupt about now. Because we know that. Because we'd mapped so many value, uh, organizations. Two weeks later, Iceland went bankrupt. Yeah, they're recovering. Now look, so this is what was going on. 
materialistic, short-term focus, positive educational opportunity, uncertainty, corruption, elitism, wasted resources, gender discrimination. I would never have guessed that in Iceland. Blame. This is what they wanted. Almost full spectrum. I say there's wisdom in the crowd. Because they, they, so, you know, they just picked 10 values. These 635 people picked 10 values about how they'd like to see their nation. And the top 10 happened to be almost full spectrum. I mean, is that wisdom in the crowd or what? And so there's the level of all this anxiety at level one. So um, what was showing up in the limiting values was materialistic, short-term focus. This is the number of votes that they got. Uncertainty, corruption, elitism, wasted resources, etc. Now, what happened, about six to nine months later, they had a national assembly and they actually discussed what was going on and they used some of this data. A year or two later, they measured again and then they got together and 25 citizens were named to rewrite a constitution. And they've just rewritten their constitution. And so, in a small way, we've been able to influence that by making their values visible making the intangibles tangible. 2009, this is what was going on just next door, and this is the, these are the values in the current culture of the US. Every one of the top ten is a limiting value. Corruption, blame, bureaucracy, crime, violence, etc., etc. This is a statistically valid sample of people in the USA answering questions about what are your personal values, what values do you see in the nation, what values would you like to see? Shocking. There is, a, there is a deep malaise in the USA. I'm going to dig deep into that in volume two, because we've got four years of data now. Bhutan. They don't focus on GDP, they focus on gross national happiness. Not a limiting value in sight. Uh, there's even got, they've got one personal limiting value. Caution. Okay, okay that's fine. There's six matching values between the current culture and desired culture. Yes, who said something? Uh, hi, hi, Eric. Erfin, yeah. What's the difference between Why do you two have funny names? Uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> they're sales <laughs> tests. But what's the difference between the uh, orange and the black? Well, the orange are matching values. So continuous improvement is here, it's over here. Environmental protection is here, it's over here. Political rights is in the current culture, it's not in the... So, but what you see showing up here in the desired is freedom of speech and economic growth. Not in the top 10. They might be 11 or 12. So that's where they need to focus, right? That's where they need to focus there. And compassion showing up here. But it's also number three, personal value. And full employment. So it is a developing country. It is landlocked. So they're wanting, more, and, and re only just recently, a constitutional democracy. So they're focusing on freedom of speech. They want economic growth so they can get full employment. And there's a sense of compassion. And you know, and so this, this is like an amazing result, which I'm going to totally analyze in volume one and volume two. Level of entropy. Yeah. So here's Canada. Just thought I'd throw this in just so you could see what was happening. Anybody who understands about Canada will know that it's a very bureaucratic nation, number one value. But very focused on human rights. Freedom of speech comes high. However, there's wasted resources, unemployment, crime and violence. Law enforcement is quite good, Bob. There's a Bob in the room. You should acknowledge that. <laughs> Corruption, uncertainty about the future, quality of life. This is Canada. This is what you want. Accountability. It's not, see, there are no matching, there's only one matching value, human rights and human rights. There are no matching values between current and desired. Bhutan, there were six. You want accountability, you want more caring for the elderly, you want more affordable housing, you want more effective health care, more caring for the disadvantaged. That's, that's a hell of a lot of compassion. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. There's not a desire for the no. rise No, but, but you, know, how, you know, the question is, this is just showing you what's showing up. How you get there, it's a conversation starter. But I'm curious about your, like, the debate, for example. Are you doing outreach and going and asking people, no. people who are already... So, 
what we did, we are actually, our company is financing that ourselves, and we're just doing it. We decided to do it every year of the Obama administration. We're not actually employed by anybody to go out and change anything. We're just making that information available. Whereas in some of the nations where we're working, there are consultants who are linking up with government, like South Africa, Latvia, Iceland, and they're actually beginning to make some changes. I mean, this is cutting edge stuff. Do we know what we're doing? No, we don't know what we're doing exactly. So this is this is statistically valid. It's across all different. You know, we've been very careful to make it statistically valid. Where we are doing in that the where the head office is in Asheville, Carolina, we're doing a really detailed community assessment, and we're getting involved with the community as we do that. And again, we're learning by doing. Sorry, I was wondering the pool of values where people choose from. Is it common between countries? Good, Good question. question. Um, in, in terms of organizations, we always customize it for the language in the organization that you're, or the type of business you're in. In nations, we have a standard set, but if, you, if we're working with somebody in the nation, they say, yeah, well, a, there are some other values that show up. We will customize it. Well, you know, I, I, all, all I can say is that we work with the organization or the people in the nation to make sure the values that are listed there make sense to them. Okay, it's not us telling them. We try and make sure it makes sense to them. But we also, in terms of nations, we try to, we have a fixed template which we then modify, but we try to modify it as little as possible so, it's, it's, so nations can be comparable. But you know, if they don't want it, that's fine. They can, we can make, totally customize it. So entropy really is down at the survival level here in Canada. These three white dots here, four white dots. So what we see here is development as economic growth, GNP per capita, USA, Iceland, Canada, development as human happiness, Bhutan. Whatever you focus on is what you get. Now, just I'm coming to the end now, I want to talk about cultural entropy and how it shows up as fear because the title of this book is Love, Fear and the Destiny of Nations. And I realize that cultural entropy equals to regime fear. Okay, what is regime fear? So a communist or authoritarian regime, they don't like dissidents, they don't like intelligent people, you get locked away or you get put to death. So there's a regime fear in certain regimes. Once you get to a level of democracy, that regime fear goes away. The next level of fear is what I call cultural DNA fear. I'll come to that in a minute. Then situational fear. What's happening in the world, like, you know, like the Twin Towers, suddenly the situational fear. You know, so you have to, and then personal fear. And so cultural entropy is actually a measure of all of these different types of fear. Regime fear, this is ge generated in totalitarian, authoritarian regimes. Cultural DNA fear, this is what Hofstede measured. I don't know whether you know his work. He looked at power distance ratios, individualism versus collectivism, masculinity versus femininity, uncertainty, avoidance. And I used his data to calculate levels of fear, cultural DNA fear in nations. So I'll, I'll show you how I use that. And then the situational fear. Now, personal fear. This is due to the quality of our parental upbringing because you remember what I talked before about zero naught to seven and your family environment? You learn some con subconscious fear-based beliefs. Those fear-based beliefs will be, will be with you. That's personal fear. But on, on the top of that is the cultural DNA fear of the culture you were brought up in, which is handed down from your parents. So here is the level of fear. I mapped, the, I was able to calculate the level of, relative level of fear in, in Hofstede's nations, over 50 of them, and map it against the Economic Intelligence Unit's Democracy Index. This is an index that measures the level of democracy from zero to 10. Democracy is, is, is a whole graduation. It's amazing when you dig into it, um, how many graduations of democracy, but what you see is, the level of fear drops significantly when you start moving into liberal democracies. So let's take this data and analyze it. It's a straight line. 
As the level of democracy, structural democracy increases, the level of fear goes down. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, yeah. it's, 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 and so fear is going up. So, so how are we going to? Yeah, I, I'm trying to summarize a whole book here in like five slides, which is impossible. But the nations with the lowest levels of cultural day and fear tend to be rich. They've achieved a le certain level of per capita income that allows people to meet their deficiency needs, survival, relationship, self-esteem needs. It's egalitarian, and there are social safety nets. The nations with the highest levels of cultural DNA fear tend to be poor, high inequality, powerful elites, dominate the masses, and people do not feel safe. It's, it, makes, I mean, it's, it makes sense. At one end of the, spectrum, spend, at one end of the democra democracy continuum, we have nations with strong fear-based cultures, pseudo-democracies and authoritarian regimes, and at the other end we have nations with high-trust liberal democracies. We would expect, therefore, to see that the nations with the highest levels of democracy operate with the highest levels of trust. So here's the level of fear against most people can be trusted. This is a survey that's been done by other people, and you see when you get to high trust, you get to low fear. And when you get to most people can be trusted and democracy, so at the highest levels of democracy, most people can be trusted. So high trust goes with high levels of democracy. People are more likely to trust each other in societies where inequality is small and less likely to trust each other where income inequality is large. So income inequality, most people can be trusted. High inequality, low trust. Low inequality or equality, most people can be trusted. So how do we reduce cultural fear? We have to help nations evolve into liberal democracies. Becoming a democracy begins to reduce the level of regime fear, reduce the level of cultural DNA fear by satisfying people's physiological and psychological deficiency needs, reduce inequality, increase trust, manage and reduce the level of situational fears. And reducing personal fear is all about the quality of parenting. Because you see, what's happening right now is children are growing up to self-actualized parents who um, uh, have never had to suffer much. So, so my parents were growing up in the war, and when I grew up, you know, there was a lot of fear because we, could we survive? Now the children growing up, they don't have survival issues if they're brought up with self-actualized parents who treat them like adults and treat them. Where, but where you're not treated like adults, you develop these subconscious fears. So the quality of parenting becomes very important. So coming to an end now, what I'm actually doing in this book is I'm making a play. I've, I've cut out a lot. I just to keep it not too dense for our presentation. I'm really making a plea for global governance. And I'm saying there comes a moment in the evolution of every society when the complexity of life conditions that are impacting the survival becomes so overwhelming it's impossible for any leader, no matter how intelligent, or any political party, no matter how skilled, to fully control the society's future. The only way to survive in such situations is to work together with other societies for the good of the whole. This has become a fundamental and urgent requirement on which the well-being of humanity now depends. Stage one, nations become viable independent democracies. Nation, stage two, nations bond together to form regional group structures, European Union. What I'm seeing is forming these regional governance structures in different parts of the world. They're already there in nascent form. And then having a, some form of world democracy, a world government, which builds from the regional democracies. Because that is the pattern that has been dictated by 14 billion years of evolution. If you want any more information, here are my things here, you can get. I just put this up on, on SlideShare. You can download the whole thing. OK, we're moving into questions. Moving into questions, I want to point out a microphone at that side of the room. And we can float a microphone. Um. So please give your name so Hi. that I know how to speak to you. Hi, Richard. Arifin Graham here again. Arifin. Nice to see you. How are you, Arifin? I'm very well. Thank you very much. You've got a lovely partner. <laughs> thank you so much. I love her. I love her deeply. Oh. <laughs> I have a quick uh, question. I have a question about how you see 
because you seem to be a big booster of the European Union model. Uh, though they seem to be going through some uh, tricky times right now. Can you please make some comments about how you see that evolving and where they're, where they're at? Thanks. Simple. Evolution is messy. No, throughout all, you know, all of evolution, what happens is things, they try things out, this and this, and then one of them is successful, and then they move a few steps down that path. And then it gets messy again. We try out different things, and the most successful ones move forward. That's exactly what's happening. In, at the level of global society right now in the European Union. It's messy. But you know, we, we have, have a perfect, perfect example of this just next door. You see, a couple of hundred years ago, the United States were united. They, they had a different money systems. The states were very different. They had different, they happened to speak the same language because most people came from the same place, but they had different monetary systems. They were independent states. And they, and then they had a, a survival issue. King George, he wanted to tax them to death. So they all got together and said, we've got to fight these guys. And they fought the guys and they won. And then they said, well, OK, uh, this worked. Uh, maybe we could all actually empathize and stick together and break down the tariffs between our states. And we could actually bond together to form a higher order entity. You see, it happened next door already. The perfect example of what I'm talking about. So evolution is messy, but that's, what, that's why I say it. We're watching evolution happen before our very eyes. You are watching your evolution happen before your very eyes. Is he working on himself? Tell me, Wilhelmina. Is he working on himself? Is he evolving before your very eyes? Are you evolving? Is she evolving? Well done. That's evolution. Because evolution has moved to consciousness. That's what evolution is about now. It's about consciousness. You see, um, anyhow, I won't go there. Let's take another question. Here and then that lady over there. No, I haven't mapped China yet, but I don't think it'll be too long. But what's your gut? I'm not going to go there. Okay. I don't like to make predictions. I like data. Over there, then that lady with the blonde hair over there. Have you, have you taken a look into the world value survey data? Yes. And, and what do you see there? Where, you see, does it match or not match your own? own, own yeah, yeah. It, there's, a, there's a lot of concordance between the, the, that data. And I show that, actually, in Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations. The problem with that data is that it's infer interesting information. But what the heck do you do with it? What do you do with it? You know this nation compared to that nation has a higher rate of this and that. And so, okay, so let's try and improve in order to keep up. But, you know, that's not what it's about, competition. Evolution is about you, your nation, becoming the best it can become. And so you need this type of survey that gets you right into what's working and what isn't working right now. So it's not, those, that data is not so practical. Well, at least in my, in my opinion. Whereas you can actually work with this. We've been working with this data in over 3,000 organizations, bringing about amazing cultural change. Charles, just say an odd word about some of the organizations you've been working with locally. You're going to get a little microphone. I'd like you to talk. Little microphone. No, you've got a little one. <laughs> Yours is bigger than mine. So I've been I've been working with uh, with Richard's work for the last four years, um, and using the cultural values assessment that he talked about with a number of companies in in Vancouver. So I was sharing with Richard just recently. We presented the second cultural values assessment to the Vancouver Port Authority. Um, it's being recorded, isn't it? Um, did they do well? They did extremely did well. Did their entropy drop? Their entropy dropped quite significantly, and you can actually point to what it was that they did, what the CEO chose to focus on, just as you pointed out earlier, uh, to address the conversation and the quality of the dialogues around how to drop their cultural entropy. Um, number of credit unions in Vancouver working with this as well, some car dealerships, or there, there are a number of organizations that are using it and using it very, very powerfully to create really meaningful conversations and dialogues with data that gives you the place to, the places to focus extremely powerful
Thank you. And that's what happened in Latvia, because when we mapped in Latvia, we were working with one of the uh, government banks, and they said, wow, we could use this in our country. So we mapped the values of Latvia, and we got to present to the government. And the government were going through a really tough time at that point around their budget, and there were riots in the streets, and the entropy was up at 50 or some percent. And so they began, to, what they said was, we're going to take this data, and they had conversations in every city around in Latvia. Now, there's a big problem in Latvia between ethnic Russians and ethnic Latvians. They don't get along. So what, that was one of the demographics. We pulled out the data for these two groups. And we found it. They simply wanted the same things, but in a different priority order. And so there was a sort of coming together in these focus groups to understand each other's positions. And what happened then after that, they developed a plan for, I think, 2020 or 2030, which was totally values-based based on what they learned from this survey. So, you know, it's early days yet, but my vision is that every country in the world manages its culture for the interests of its citizens, and we, we do that for humanity. Because otherwise, evolution is going to be haphazard. We've had enough of haphazard evolution. I have. That lady over there is really insistent. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. My name is Christine. Um, I'm very intrigued by your cultural values assessment tool, and I'm wondering if you have considered or are interested in applying this work to classrooms and families. Absolutely. And schools. schools. We do it. In, we do it in schools. Um, in the uh, at the level of the teachers, admin, and parents, but we can actually do it in classrooms too. But like primary school classrooms? Yeah. yeah. But we don't have the same words. We have a smaller set and we have phrases. Um, you know, uh, the phrases which mean one word, but actually for kids it's a lot easier to understand. Okay, yep. thank you. Hey, well, you might not, but the people listening oh, I might. I, I, you should out mention, there. I should mention that there are more people online than there are here, uh, about 70 at least. Well, my name is Wendy Turner. Wendy Turner, welcome. Yes, thank you. Um, I was wondering if you'd made any connection with your thought about consciousness and the new knowledge that we're learning about the human brain. Yes. And how it ties in with some of your thoughts. Absolutely. I start new leadership, sorry, Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations, talking about the integral model. Anybody heard of the integral model? A few of you. Okay. All right. See, how can I cover that in one minute? <laughs> Okay. All right. Look, there's a fellow called Ken Wilbur. He looked at all of the data that we have about everything in the world and he said, ah, it took him weeks and weeks to figure it out, but it's so simple. There are four quadrants. There's, the inter there's, there's you and me and there's this whole group of people. All right. So what's going on inside me, my values and beliefs, and then what's going on outside of me, my actions and behaviors. Then, uh, we're all part of this group, so what's going on in the group, organization and nation, are the values and beliefs of the nation, and what's going on outside of the inside the nation, but physically, are the actions and behaviors. So, you've got the internal of the individual, the internal of the collective, the external of the individual, the external of the collective. All right, now, if you think about what is the internal of the, in sorry, the, uh, the external of the individual is actually the brain and how it evolved. So the brain has been evolving for, human brain has been evolving for millions of years. Uh, the human brain, Homo sapiens brain right now, is twice as big as it was originally. So, and it has developed three parts, the reptilian, the limbic, and now the prefrontal cortex, the reasoning. And so that evolution has been going on. At the same time, as human societies have been evolving too. So what happens is the internal of the individual, the external, the internal of the collective, the external of the collective, all evolve at the same time. And, and so what that means is when you look at most of research, uh, and I say this in a university setting, most research in universities focuses on the external of the individual, body, the brain, etc., or the external of the collective, political social science. It does not focus on the internal of the individual or the internal of the collective. And so, it, it, so when you read Fukuyama and all of these other books, they're brilliant, 
but they're not integral. They don't take account of all of these other dimensions. And that's what I attempt to do in Love, Fear, and the Destiny of Nations. Bring an integral approach. So you'll find in that book a whole discussion about the development of the brain as well as the development of the culture, the development of the seven levels of values, the ego and the soul, and political science. It's all in there, but in an integral way. It was so much fun. I've been involved with values for a number of years, working. You know, we all have since we were born almost. So, <laughs> but you've been actually I, thinking about it. Well, I've been working with a company that, that had an index as well. But um, my background is education, and I've been listening to you quite carefully this evening to see, because I'm interested in the integral model of education, and seeing how what kind of research have you done around education? What kind of data do you have that one could glean from and begin to apply in the change in a more general sense of the new education, the new evolutionary trend towards new well, education? Well, the answer is not much because most of the mapping of values in the 3,000 plus organizations have been for profits, you know, quite a number of municipal agencies and government agencies and some educational agencies, but we've never got down to that level of detail. Interesting, coming out of my research for the Love, Fear and the Destiny of Nations, what came up was the quality of the upbringing of the child determines the level of personal fear, and the, term, the, the personal fear affects the culture and affects the level of democracy that you can get to. And so what I saw from that is we have to bring our children up differently. And that's been my conclusion. And what I noticed, because I taught from kindergarten level to university level, and observed in children a light in the eyes, a knowing, a deep intuitive knowing about how to proceed with life. And as we bring them through the system, the light dims. Yep. And we constrict the learning, and we make it narrower and narrower, as opposed to making it broader and broader as we go along. Yeah. So we don't open the evolutionary scope of education. What we do is we close it down in order to be in a controlled environment. And so we can control the learning and the knowledge. But basically, you're quite right. We've forgotten the internal part, which is the intuitive. And that's the knowing. It's not the knowledge. Absolutely. So I'd be very interested in continuing this conversation with you. Well, that leads me into a whole conversation about the six levels of decision making. Um, which I've written about extensively. Um, the first level of decision making is instincts, uh, DNA encoded responses to survival situations. We all that's the, our animal nature. That's one level of decision making. Subconscious belief based decision making. Those are the beliefs that we learn from zero to seven when the limbic brain is working really well. And you know you're uh, operating like that if you get angry, upset, or you get that email. Anybody had one of those emails that really pissed them off? And you go, <laughs> Oh my God, I sent it to everybody? You know, you realize you got angry and upset and you sent this aggressive email out there. That's subconscious belief-based decision making. You insert a pause between the event and your reaction. Now you can think about how to reply. That's called conscious belief-based decision making. And that's how most of the world works. But the problem with these three modes of decision making, they're all based on information from the past. Now, so you move to values-based decision making. Suddenly you say, how do I want to respond? Oh, I want to respond with trust. You consciously create this experience, the future you want to experience with values-based decision making. The other great thing about values-based decision making is our world has become so complex that the beliefs we have are not good enough to solve the problems we've got. So you've got to shift to another level. You know, if you take all the religious leaders of the world and get them to war around a table to talk about, okay, so talk about your beliefs and come to some agreement, it will never happen. Get them around the table and say, talk about your values. That's a different matter altogether. So values come next. And then after values comes intuition. As you open and let go of your fears, what happens is you open yourself up to intuition from another dimension of consciousness. And, and for a number of years, I wrote about five modes of decision making. Then I really I discovered the sixth mode, which was inspiration, the voice of the soul. 
which guides you every day. Once you can get to that space of having no fears, recognizing that really you've got no fundamental needs, there's nothing you're worrying about, you open yourself up to the inspiration of the soul. And what happens at that moment is synchronicity rains down on you. Because at another level of existence, that quantum reality where the soul lives, it's arranging things. So you just walk through life with ease. And things happen in front of you. You don't have to do anything. Because, you know, it takes a while to get there. But if we could raise our kids like that, wouldn't that be great? Need your help. Oh, well, <laughs> don't count on me. I, I go. I <laughs> Hi, uh, Emmanuel Ruda. Uh, Hello, Emmanuel. Uh, my partner and I uh, are the founders of League Assets Corp here in town. We're building the uh, city next door. He's uh, building the city next door? That's right. A whole city? That's correct. Well, city center, brand new city center, oh. Hollywood oh, City good Center. Good for you. Thank you. Um, I'm uh, very happy and inspired to hear what you were talking about today because, uh, oddly enough, we were talking about the very same things in our, in our team meeting. Uh, one of the things that we're bringing into our company, because we do want to be one of the best places to work in Canada, the best, uh, is uh, personal mentoring and coaching to every one of our staff. Fantastic. About 80 people. And um, If I may interrupt you, yeah. um, just make a sales pitch. You can download those modules of <laughs> $30 each. That you can go and do it. <laughs> you've got, you've, you've uh, pre preempted my question. Um, and the other part, uh, which is showing up now, is that our staff is actually going, getting out and contributing uh, into the local community as well as our company donates 5% of our bottom line annually to humanitarian causes. And so my question was, how does uh, a values-based corporation, uh, a body of people, corporation, uh, who are cooperating, uh, go about engaging uh, your company and what is the process like and if possible, uh, what is the cost even? Well. Okay, you, you, you don't actually engage us directly because we've trained people, all, 3, 000, over 3,000 people all over the world. And how many people are sitting in this room who've done our training? Look around. Okay, they can all, you can work with all of them. You go to them, say, we'd like to use this. They will work with you on customizing. We'll do the values assessment, give it to them. They'll come to you and they'll unfold it. Or you can even train your own people. It's as easy as that. Uh, you know, for a group of 50 people, you know, it's, it's less than $5,000. Time uh, from... Uh, four weeks. So, next month you could be totally values driven. Okay. Isn't that amazing? I'll run the speech. <laughs> <next month. How's laughs> <that? laughs> Consciously. Uh, at least you will know where your values are. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. Of course, we also have the graduate. And we have the graduate <laughs> city <laughs> values based leadership. Let's not forget that because how many people are on the graduate based leadership here tonight? There they are. You see, talk to them. Are they having a good time? I don't know, but anyhow, I hope so. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kim. I have a, Hi, Kim. a bit of a two-part question. One is whether or not you've made any comparisons or drawn any conclusions between um, current personal values and desired corporate values across industries, um, so the purpose of the organization, as well as looking at or comparing the demographics of an organization to see if there are similarities or differences. Funny you should ask that, Kim, because we just finished a huge piece of research we've been waiting 14 years to do, well, actually about four or five years. We've just took 750 of our corporate assessment or cultural values assessments and we've analyzed them. And what we've done is we've said, you know, uh, how many companies had entropy below 10? How many between 10 and 20? How many, et cetera. So we plotted that. We said, we're saying, um, what are the values that are showing up in those companies with less than 10% entropy, the ones that are really good, what are the values showing up? So we've been doing data mining just this last six months to answer and by industry. So we've got industry, information and we've got that whole information so that's a uh, that's that information is downloadable and if you can't get it just uh, drop me a line at richard at value center and I'll, we'll send it to you go to valuecenter.com it's full of information uh, we just you know we love to give information away what was the second part Generation. different generations yeah well so what you can do when you do a values assessment in a organization, a nation, or anything, or a community, you can specify the demographics. So what you do is say, you know, what age group are you? And then you just pull out the data for each age group, and you can see the differences. 
what are their personal values, what values they see in that culture, what values they'd like to see. And it's different by different age groups because at different, you're at different seasons of your life. So, you know, people in the 20 to 30 are really interested in continuous learning and growth, etc. And with the senior people, you know, they're interested in something different. And so you get differences by, um, by age, different age group. You get differences by different role levels in the organization. You get differences by different ethnic groupings. You get differences by gender. And so you can specify those all at the front of a survey and you can pull all that data out. One of the examples we just case studies we just did in our group here is we looked at a one of the top banks in South Africa and we pulled out the data for four racial groups whites, blacks, coloreds and Indian, uh, Indian people and it was really significantly different for all of those. Some of them had big fears and others had less fears because of the situation. It was easy to, if you knew the situation there you could explain it. So we can pull out that data by any of those demographic units and, and begin to take a look at what's going on. The data that we get out of this is a conversation starter. It starts new conversations you've never had before, and that's when transformation happens, when you have a new conversation you've never had before. I mean, think about a relationship you might have with a, a significant other, and it's not going well. And you get to a point where somebody has to say something, and you have a new conversation you've never had before. And then transformation happens, hopefully. Is that right, Wilhelmina? Or not? Sure. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> I, I, can't, I just can't do your real name, I'm sorry. Excuse me, but I, I, I haven't quite got the right. I can't do the Alleluia with a W in front. There's a workshop on that. Okay, good. <laughs> I'll sign up. Anything else? Any more? Yes, sir. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Henry. And, um, I'm Tell me, I, how do you feel about having two first names? I like it. Yeah? I often win, you know, I, I, anyhow, go ahead, John Henry. <laughs> Henry's my middle name. I used to go by John and people would say, I can't remember that guy's name, but... <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, at any rate, I'm struggling with a question, and it has to do with homecoming for military people and their families, and it's a global phenomenon, and nobody's figured it out. And it's, uh, it's a pretty cost, costly kind of epidemic of suicides and catastrophic divorce rates and homelessness and domestic violence and divorce. And it's all wrapped up in this phenomenon of coming home from war and then separating from military to civilian life. And I'm wondering, you know, how I think that values plays a role in getting back to what's most important because I'm struggling because nobody's figured out homecoming and I'm wondering if values might be a yeah. link that if there's a subset of your data or that could be developed as a as a community project because that's you know, what we do. I don't know how to respond to your question other than to say um, it, the, the, the model and the personal values assessment has been very significant in helping chronically unemployed people who've never worked get back to work and that work has been done in Holland and it was amazing results um, but simply what happened was that people began to realize that they could be responsible for their lives as they looked at the different levels of consciousness and figured out where they were and then understood they could they could be free of all of that now I don't know whether it were in your case I have no idea I couldn't live you, you know Yeah, you know, and I can't, I'm not qualified to talk about that. You know, I, I deal with relatively normal people. Uh, well, <laughs> with one or two exceptions. You know, people who work in organizing. I, I don't do with tra severely, work with tra severely traumatized people. And I have no idea what this would do for them or not. Frankly, it's beyond my scope. So, but I'd be interested to talk with you about later about whatever that might look like. It's just beyond me right now. It's the unknown. Glad you came. We had so much fun.
Hi, Richard. Yes. Uh, this is Gavin. Um, I see that in many ways you're, you're a scientist, you, you appreciate data and everything, and yet you use this term soul in such a comfortable way. And for someone that's never really been able to talk to the soul, or like you mentioned intuition, um, inspiration, how can I access that? Because I've noticed it's just, you know, it's run through all, all your books. I haven't read your earlier uh, works, but uh, can you help uh, a lay person like me yeah. understand what you're talking about? Okay. Thank you. I'll do the best I can. Uh, I have to tell you about my cosmology, you know. What I know is this. And I was, uh, by the way, I have a first class honors in civil engineering. Okay, I did that for 20 years, transportation planning. Suddenly realized I was dyslexic when I was young because I, I thought I had transportation, but it was actually transformation. <laughs> so, I hate to say this in the university setting, I don't have a single qualification for what I do. Not, nothing. But this is what I know. I know, at least from science, and what scientists seem to agree on, is that 14 billion, almost 14 billion years ago, there was a huge bang. And there was energy everywhere. And everything that is in this room and on this planet came out of that energy field. I know that. At least I think I do. Because that's what, you know, I'm only working on what is a common belief. It's called science. It's what's a common belief. So then, uh, out of this energy field came matter. And out of this matter came living beings. And out of these living beings came us. And so... I've come to realize there's a, a, an experiential side of my existence that goes beyond just simple materiality. And that goes beyond this, this uh, ego of mine, which thinks it's in a physical body, living in a physical environment, and it's doing the damnedest to protect this physical body. And, to stick, and, and fear plays an important role in that, but then sometimes fear can go overboard and be dysfunctional. And then I know that as, I know as that fear goes away, um, I feel trust and I feel love. And suddenly there's some, another whole meaning in life and something that gets my juices flowing because I begin to realize there's something I'm passionate about. Where did that come from? Where does your passion come from? Where does that thing that you really, you know, you see it on TV, the cooking shows, I love that. I don't watch the cooking shows to watch the cooking shows. Well, I watch the cooking shows simply to see these people, the dentist, the civil engineer, this, this and that. And they all say, oh, what I'm really passionate about is cooking. I go, wow, there's the soul. See, so for me, the soul is an individuated aspect of that energy field. My, uh, Einstein knew that everything is, we just live in this huge energy field. And that matter, we see matter in the physical form because we are in the physical form, but actually everybody has an energy field. And that's measurable. People can measure the energy fields and the vibrational frequencies. And so that's who we really are. We really are that energy field. And when you pay attention to your energy field, you, where you do, you, feel, you have feelings. That's the energy field happening. And really, that, those feelings that you have, the joy, the sadness, the fear, all come from the misalignment of the fears of the ego with the values of the soul. And so when you're in alignment, you get in flow. And when you're out of alignment, you feel the fear. You feel, have these feelings coming up. And so what I see as myself, I see myself as an individuated energy field which is part of this bigger energy field. Um, and every one of you is part of that energy field. And you're all individuated aspects of that energy field. And this is where you may say I take a leap in faith. But when I die, my energy field continues. Because energy can't be created or destroyed. And science tells us that. And, and so there's another level of reality. It's called the quantum reality that science really... It uses, but it hasn't got to grips with this idea. So let me de demonstrate what that might look like. Have you got a, uh, your book, uh, Bob? Yeah. 
Here beginneth the 14th lesson. Okay, there we are. So there's, a, there's, an, there's another dimension to reality, is a quantum reality, an energetic reality. I call it the fourth dimension of consciousness. So not, let's not get into time being the fourth dimension. Let's say time is part of a three-dimensional reality, just for the moment. So what is it like to be in that reality compared to the three-dimensional reality? Well, we can get an idea about that by comparing two-dimensional reality to three-dimensional reality. So let's assume living on the surface of this book are some two-dimensional beings. They know length and breadth. They have got not a clue about height. So we, as three-dimensional beings, we do that. We're messing with their minds because they're out for a walk today and they find five separate circles. Because they don't know height. They go just find five separate circles and they take one of these circles and they start pulling it and then all the other circles move. And they go, wow, isn't that interesting? And they say, let's call some more scientists from another university. And they repeat all the experiments. And then they, get to, they believe they know all there is to know about these five separate circles. But we know they actually, they're all connected up here. See, that's how we live. We don't understand the quantum reality and the fact that the soul lives in that quantum reality and is at that other level of consciousness. And when you get into alignment with your soul, you get into flow and synchronicity rains down on you because synchronicity is unconnected events with a common meaning. In other words, unconnected circles with a common meaning because there's a common cause at that high level. And that's the energy field where we're all connected. So if you can move into that space, life gets really easy. Because you don't have, all you have to do is show up and follow instructions. And I say that, that's how I wrote the last three books. I, I, I just got the messages. And I just wrote the answers down. And then I used my logic to figure out how to play, make it all figure. But that's about as much as I can tell you. And so it works for me. If it works for you, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's okay. I don't, I'm not going to preach. I'm just answering your question. What are you laughing at? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are we, are we somewhere near the answer? or are you, How are you feeling? Okay, good. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Hi, my name's uh, Melina Schofield. I'm uh, one of these lay people. Happened to just coincidentally be also a civil engineer. Signed up for transportation, not transformation. <laughs> till, until I saw the Royal Roads program. And I was looking for something. In my employment, I saw leadership opportunities and challenges that went beyond what I knew how to deal with. And I knew that I had huge potential to grow and huge potential to make a difference in the world and I wanted to improve my ability to do that. And then I stumbled upon the values-based leadership program and it has been incredible. It truly has been a transformation for me. Um, I had never thought about my consciousness before. I'm not religious. So, you know, that wasn't the kind of conversations we had in my family or my circles or my networks. And I have come through this program with such a tremendous understanding of concepts that really have moved my entire thinking. I looked through my career, there were a few big turning points for me in terms of what I did, how I did it, and I'm looking at this one as another perfect example of that. And so I want to express my gratitude to Richard who has helped us kick, kick off the Values-Based Leadership Program. This is the very first one. We're the first cohort. It's an experiment. In my view, it's been a wonderful experience. And I highly encourage those of you who might be interested to explore it. And thank you again to Richard for his participation, his support, the ideas that just came to him. Amazing. And um, we know that there's a lot of challenging kinds of meetings he must have. You know, us students were like, oh my God, what do you do when you get in with the leaders and you present all this data and you show them the cultural entropy? And, and we know he has to give them a dose of reality. And so we wanted him to think of us when we give him our little bit of Royal Real. Roads, Hatley Castle Blend, reality.
Yes, it's been a wonderful experience. I encourage you to explore it further. Thanks. Thank you. I'm also part of the first cohort. My name is Elan Bailey, and uh, I work in consulting, and I work with people at a coaching level. And uh, for me, I have been uh, 22, maybe 25 years floating out there as a misfit, trying to figure out how values fit in, how the soul fits into the corporate equation, how it fits into society and, and communities and nations. And I too stumbled, and I can't tell anybody how I found the, how how I found the information on the website. Stumbled across it, made a very uh, immediate decision. Very happy to be part of the first cohort, and to get to spend actual time with Richard in the classroom and have these kind of dynamic, life-changing experiences. Uh, so it's been really incredible, and you've all been very patient and very well entertained. But I want to say thank you, and I want to pass along to you. Um, a, co a signed copy of Robert Bateman's latest book. Thank you. Thank you. I, and I'd just like to uh, invite um, Ali Mina, William and Mina. <laughs> you Wasn't she great? We, we could do a double act, you know that? Sure, let's do it. This is called Synchronicity, yes. We'll synchronicity. Later. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. One of the things we asked Richard was uh, the proceeds from this evening, a voluntary contribution, to what charity would he want to contribute? And he said, anything that would help single mums and abused women, and I'm pleased to uh, uh, recognize Jackie Cox Ziegler, who's here from the Women's Transition House. Jackie. So don't go home without leaving a contribution. <laughs> We're done. Over there. Thank you again. Colorado and Montreal and so uh, welcome and thanks for joining us online. Just wanted to mention that uh, the signing of the books are over here. Richard will be with you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.